hungry and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Welcome to this service of worship. We're glad that you're with us. We have a few things that we want to make sure are part of your awareness as we continue in worship and you'll find those community notes at the end of the video. But in this moment, let us together use these questions as a way to prepare for worship, for our worship service together.
To see Christ in everyone is not a reflection on everybody else's goodness. It's supposed to reflect our own. We must admit the ways we do not act Christ-like toward others, even towards ourselves. Let us begin with silent prayer. Dear God, we look for you. Sometimes we see you in the blessings we receive. Sometimes we see you in the good things that happen. Sometimes we see you in your word and even in your church. Forgive us for failing to look for you in our own actions and thoughts. Forgive us for not looking for you in our hearts. Please help us change that. Gratefully, we pray this. Thank you for listening, God. Amen. Sometimes God doesn't make any sense to me. Seriously, I'll read something God says or wants, and it just doesn't add up. I mean, it might sound good, but practically, it's just not workable. For example, you know, I'm supposed to forgive my brother 70 times 7, right? That can't be right. And then I'm supposed to be thankful in all situations, and I know that's not right. And God couldn't splurge on better digs for Jesus in that manger um, than that manger. Or if God can feed the 5,000, why couldn't God have made sure that they weren't hungry in the first place? And if God can do anything, why do those people in Raleigh or Uvalde or Greensboro or Graham or Buckhorn or Columbine or that church in South Carolina or, or the concert in Las Vegas or, or, I don't know, any number of other places burned into our memories have to die? Why did people on our prayer list have to suffer? Why did Jesus have to suffer? Why not just fix everything? But the problem with trying to judge God's ethics and behavior is that we are in no position to judge. When it comes to our own behavior, when it, when it comes to us, we are incorrigible, incoherent, and incomparable. This is not to say that we shouldn't ever question God. Of course, if the creation stories from last weekend were any indication, the creator of the universe is more than capable of handling some questions from the creation. The ability to even do so comes from God. But our track record as a humanity is not exactly pristine, right? I mean, God is not the one who abdicated responsibility for the earth. God is not the one who abdicated responsibility for our fellow humanity. God is not the one who shot people in all of those places. God is not the one who chose to ignore warning signs abused our positions of power and privilege, or otherwise failed 
to live up to our humanity. We did that. We chose to do those things. And look, for any of us who want to say, well, it wasn't me. I can't be held responsible for what other people do. Okay, that, that's kind of true. I mean, the boys, and they were boys who committed those crimes at Columbine, are the ones responsible for what they did, but also responsible are the ones who chose to ignore the boys' need for an adult role model. Also responsible are the fellow classmates who bullied them. Also responsible are the fathers who, and who chose to leave their families and the boys in question with nothing. Also responsible is the community surrounding the boys who expected the boys to figure out their own path. The list is extensive. And all those responsible won't be held responsible. But that's not, I don't know, that's really, it is actually really the issue, isn't it? Who's really responsible? As we contemplate this question, God's answer to us is clear. Whatever problems we see may not be our fault or as a result of our actions directly, but God expects us to take responsibility. To be clear, we are to act because we are able to respond. The judgment of the nations, okay, in the passage that we are going to read, um, is wide-ranging and is not something God imposes. Listen to Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. Listen for the word of God to us all. Now when the human one comes in his majesty, and all his angels are with him, he will sit on his majestic throne. All the nations will be gathered in front of him. He will separate them from each other, just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right side, but the goats he will put on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who will receive good things from my father. Inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you before the world began. I was hungry, and you gave me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothes to wear. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then those who are righteous will reply to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and give you clothes to wear? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? Then the king will reply to them, I assure you that when you have done it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you have done it for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Get away from me, you who will receive terrible things. Go into the unending fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry, and you didn't give me food to eat. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't welcome me. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothes to wear. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or, or naked or sick or in prison and, and didn't do anything to help you? Then he will answer, I assure you that when you haven't done it for one of the least of these, you haven't done it for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous ones will go into eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, as I said, the judgment of the nations is wide-ranging and is not something that God imposes. We impose it. We impose it with what we say and do or with what we don't say and what we choose not to do. And what's fantastic is that the righteous and the unrighteous don't even know that they were being so. Their choices to exercise compassion or not, is what brought judgment, not vengeance. No tricks, no mystery. You know, when you read all of Matthew 25, okay, it is a telling historical picture. The first parable in the chapter challenges us to be ready for the coming of God's chosen because it could happen at any time. 
The second parable challenges us to do something with what we've been given. Don't hoard it or hide it or just have it, but use it. The pinnacle, though, the crown of the parables in Matthew 25 is this sheep and goat business. The way to be ready, the way to use our gifts is through acting as though the people that we encounter are like helping Christ himself. What's telling about the picture the gospel paints here is that the very next chapter sees the leadership plotting to kill Jesus. But why? Why is what Jesus is suggesting here, commanding here, so threatening? What makes it so radical? One of the things I've read people emphasize is the punishment phase of this parable. I mean, out of the 15 verses, okay, in, in, the par in, this, in this passage that we read, the punishment, or better, the consequences of not practicing comp compassion, is presented in one verse. And that tells me that there's a lot more to pay attention to, but while we're talking about verse 41, let's take a closer look. The verse describes unending fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Wow. But in any story, it's important to know what characters you're dealing with. So who are the players? Well, the word that we translate devil also means deceiver. Any honest assessment of our common humanity has got to include an acknowledgement of our capacity for self-deception and for deceiving others. The devil that we're looking for many times is ourselves. And why do we do this? Well, to mask something. Maybe we don't want people to know our motivations. Maybe we don't want people to realize our past. Maybe we don't want people to know our weaknesses. Maybe we're just afraid of what people might do if they really knew us. Whatever the reason for our masks, we deceive out of our self-interest. To the degree the devil is a person, be sure and start with the person in the mirror. Now listen, I'm not exactly uplifting words, I know, but I promise there is hope coming. Now the second players in this in that part of the past in the passage um, are his angels. So, as you may have heard many times, the word that we translate angels really just means messengers. Anything and anyone who communicates the devil's deceptions. Now, I'm sorry to be the one to say this at this moment, but the character, those characters, the angels, yeah, those, all of that is us also. You know, I remember a therapist suggesting that I stop playing the cassette tape recording in my head of things that I would say to myself that weren't true. Replace the mechanism with whatever you like, okay? A broken record, uh, a scratched CD, a corrupted music file, a spotty streaming service, the serious XM of spirituality. We don our masks and then act on being the characters that the masks represent. And it's no wonder that we're exhausted. It's no wonder anxiety and stress rule over our society with impunity. If the goal to maintain masks is paramount, then we are destined for failure. We weren't built that way. Eventually, just like everything else in our life, our masks have limits. The truth about what we face or confront takes hold. I mean, I can look at someone and say to myself, there's nothing I can do to help. But is it really true? I can see a friend in pain and say to myself, I don't, I don't know what to do. But is that really true? I can look at the enormity of the problems of hunger, conflicts, loneliness, or most insidiously, apathy, and say to myself, nothing I do can change those things. I'm just one person. But is that really true? You know, one of the brilliant things, okay, about the law to love your neighbor as yourself is that the wisdom contained in the law, the clarity of it, is self-contained. It's right there in what's said. Whether you're talking about hunger, grief, a health crisis, a health crisis, 
fear, um, and seriously, look, any problem, we have but one question to ask ourselves. What would I want done, or what would I want someone to do for me? And then do that. But the messages that we send ourselves and each other are potent. They can stain us for generations, teaching us to speak lies like, well, that's just how it's always been. The false messages can color how we see and perceive, even govern our actions. It's no wonder Jesus warns us about them. And as I said, we're almost there with the hope. Just hang in there. The third character in this part of the verse, I mean, this part of the passage that we're looking at, is unending fire. And of course, entire books have been written about these two words. Images of hell, Hades, Paradise Lost, Dante's Inferno. Eternal punishment, you name it. But for a people whose religious practice included sacrifice and whose culture included farming, we enlightened folks would do well to stop and take a breath and consider the context of what Jesus is saying here. You know, sacrifices were burnt back in the day. Um, some of the sacrifices were taken by the priests in question since their religious practice was their job. But the clear majority of the sacrifice was burned. It was a way to ensure that it was that what was dedicated remained dedicated. Now, hold on to that thought while we think about culture. You know, when farming, you've got to deal with an awful lot, right? A scourge of growing, um, um, a scourge of growing, right, um, is weeds and plants that don't yield. Well, what are you supposed to do with them? Well, they were burned. You don't need those bad seeds getting mixed up with the good, and you can't really use them for anything, so burn them. Well, the same concept filters out to other industries. Take sword making. To get the best tempered steel, you have to heat the metal in order to beat out infirmities. To get pure gold, you burn away what isn't gold. And to get the righteous people God is after, God seeks to purify us also. Which is why Jesus even tells us this parable in the first place. Well, so what does the rest of the parable then tell us? How are we supposed to take what Jesus is saying? One of the things that I love about children um, is the ways um, that they unequivocally reveal the teachings of the adults in their lives. And it's not just what they are told. They reveal what the big people in their lives actually practice. Um, those lessons that they get over and over and over again show up in ways that are outside of even sometimes their awareness, but they do show up. The priorities that the adults important to them have are the priorities they will have, even if they rebel. God's goal for us is to get to the point where we have practiced compassion so much that it's just what we do. It's our default reaction. If someone needs help, we just help. If someone needs a hug, we just hug. If someone needs food, we just cook. If someone needs an ear, we just listen. If someone needs a savior, we remind them that we do also, and we look to Jesus. Matthew 25 suggests that godly living this way becomes so much a part of the, our nature that we aren't even aware that we are acting divinely. We're just being who we're supposed to be. We're just acting as we've been trained to act. We're acting as children of the living God. If it was on a grading system, we're not getting A's. We're just getting a C for being run-of-the-mill Christians. And listen, it's an old idea. Just listen to Leviticus 19, Verses 9 through 11, for example. When you harvest your land's produce, you must not harvest all the way to the edge of your field. And don't gather up every remaining bit of your harvest. Also, don't pick your vineyard clean or gather up all the grapes that have fallen there. Leave these items for the poor and the immigrant. I am Yahweh, your God. You must not steal, nor deceive, nor lie to each other. You know, but the deception thing looms. We must remember that compassion and coercion are sometimes not as far apart from each other as they should be. 
there's a sister church, okay, that offers rent or utility assistance near us, close to us. But in order to get their assistance, you've got to attend one or more of their services. And there are some other stipulations, but you get the idea. And I get it. They want to emphasize that it's more important in their minds that the person in question gets the word and gets their needs met. Other places I know want to make sure that the person in question doesn't waste the money um, or on alcohol or cigarettes or scratch-off tickets. And I get that also. I really do. The thought is, if this person can't be responsible, then I'll be responsible for them. Does that make sense? But can you imagine if I offered you $10,000, but in order to get the money, you had to live the way I want for a week? Would you take it? Or if, I were, if you were starving for food and I had a table with the best smelling biscuits you've ever seen, but to get them, you had to paint my walls first. Does that still look like compassion? Is that just a trade? If I gave you a birthday present, but then said to you, you can have this, but only if you play with it on Tuesday when I can be there with you. Is it still a gift? And would you still want it? Imagine if God said, so you all need a savior, but first you got to get your act together and then I'll send Jesus. Where would we be? What would we know? And, and how would God's ethics be any different from ours? You see, a gift doesn't have strings. If I give a gift, I can't then expect someone to use it the way I would. It's not then a gift. We don't give because of the worthiness or trustworthiness or even the similarity of belief in the other person. When Jesus says, you did it to me, it's not because that other person is Jesus. It's because Jesus lives in you, lives in me. The Christ we serve should be able to be seen in each person in need before us. And this should be true because we carry Christ with us. We act because of who God is, because of who we are in Christ. The standard Jesus is raising here isn't for the world. It's for us. One last character review, right, from the parable. Why the least of these? Why does God seem to have a bent, a preference for the poor, the widow, the sick, the imprisoned, the weak? In an effort to remove the most difficult mask of all, the least of these represents a divine reminder of a straightforward truth. All of us are the least of these. That person in need isn't just Christ. It's me. It's me under different circumstances. It's me having made different choices. It's me with a story I don't know yet. And I'm in no position to judge. It's me presenting an opportunity to practice being who God dreams for me to be. We owe it to ourselves to be ready for Christ's arrival. Whomever that might be whomever that might be. We owe it to God to be good stewards of the gifts with which we've been entrusted to whomever might need it. And we honor the gifts God made us to be when we are simply compassionate as a matter of habit. My brothers and sisters in Christ, may it be so. Amen.
we give not from obligation or even coercion by God or anyone else. We give as an ongoing expression of our faith. We give because we acknowledge God has blessed us and because God seeks most for us. God seeks most for us to actually be a blessing. We don't give because we have. We give because we can, as we can, in response to an unfailing grace of God toward us. As we consider the blessings we've received and the blessings we have been this week, let us ask God's grace on what has been given. Let us pray together. Creator God, please, continue to make us all blessings according to your purpose. May we not simply be recipients of your gifts, but conduits of your grace. Thank you for your trust, O Lord. Teach us to live trustworthy. Bless what has been given, including us, we pray, in the great name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As we pray together, um, I will note for you that our prayer will be um, taken from the words of Psalm 145. There will also be a moment during the prayer where you can lift up um, your private concerns um, and, and joys before God, and I encourage you to do so then. And if you have to, pause the video um, if you need more time. But in this moment... Let us pray together. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. I will lift you up high, my God, the true King. I will bless your name forever and always. I will bless you every day. I will praise your name forever and always. Yahweh is great and so worthy of praise. God's greatness can't be grasped. One generation will praise your works to the next one, proclaiming your mighty acts. They will talk all about the glorious splendor of your majesty. I will contemplate your wondrous works. They will speak of the power of your awesome deeds. I will declare your great accomplishments. They will rave in celebration of your abundant goodness. They will shout joyfully about your righteousness. Yahweh is merciful and compassionate, very patient, and full of faithful love. Yahweh is good to everyone and everything. God's compassion extends to all his handiwork. Your kingdom is a kingship that lasts forever. Your rule endures for all generations. Yahweh is trustworthy in all that he says, faithful in all that he does. Yahweh supports all who fall down, straightens up all who are bent low. All eyes look to you, hoping and you give them their food right on time, opening your hand and satisfying the desire of every living thing. Yahweh is righteous in all his ways, faithful in all his deeds. Yahweh is close to everyone who calls out to him, to all who call, to call out to him sincerely. God shows favor to those who honor him, listening to their cries for help and saving them. This is why, Lord, it's such a dissonance when we witness the ongoing wars and conflicts, the storms, the other natural disasters, the health crises, the, the economic crises that we face, the challenges that we face right here around us and within us. All of it can be discouraging and disheartening. And so we pray for so many in our community who are sick and shut in and in rehab and, and anticipating procedures. We pray for those among us who've lost loved ones even this week. We think of those on our public and private prayer lists. Lord, intervene, as only your mercies can. Help us not only reach for your hand, O God, help us be your hands. Hear us now, please, as we lift up our private prayers.
Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for transforming us. Thank you for teaching us even how to pray when words fail us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us together say our benediction. The Christ we serve should be able to be seen in each person in need before us. This should be true because we carry Christ with us. Get up and take heart. Jesus is still calling you. Go, and may the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds this week and forevermore. Amen. So among the things that we want to make sure you make note of for this week, we should be serving Jesus literally in each other. Um, if the passage, our passage for this weekend is any indication, um, Matthew 25 itself is a, a terrific series of parables, right, that culminate in the judgment of the nations. And there we are challenged, we were challenged to serve Christ in the least of these. So how will you serve Christ this week? And all year, really. How will you, what will you do to recognize Jesus in others? And most importantly, in yourself. How will you recognize Jesus in what you say and in what you do? Think about that as you move through the week. The Spiritual Life Committee continues um, with our use of the church-wide curriculum resources, resource from our denomination. Follow Me is our study in being a more disciple-oriented church. And we are within the next series, Welcoming All. And there are several ways to get connected with the resources for the study in addition to the worship services. There is an adult class available on Sunday mornings. Um, there are two that meet Monday evening, one in person and one online. Um, you can also get the study materials to use on your own. And children and youth are going to be exploring these passages in their own way. So for more information, please do reach out to our church educator, Mandy Ely. We also want to make sure you're aware that there's a, um, the Community Life Committee is hosting a question and answer session or forum on Sunday, November the 6th from 2 o'clock to 4 p.m. Uh, in the sanctuary. Our guest presenters will be Mebane City Mayor, Mayor Ed, Ed Hooks, along with Mebane City Manager, Chris Rollins, and Assistant City Manager, Preston Mitchell. And so please do join us and invite your friends and neighbors to come and ask questions that they may have regarding new businesses, new roads, emergency and, and sanitation services, healthcare, shopping, schools, you name it. Questions may be submitted in advance, if you choose, by emailing them to info at hallfieldschurch.org no later than Thursday, November 3rd. But in any event, we hope um, and pray that you will take this opportunity um, and we look forward to seeing you there. Pray well. And thanks. <laughs>